So we are at session 18b, second part, and we are in the middle of the proof of the inversion theorem for the short time Fourier transform. I'm providing some ideas which are going a little bit beyond the approach presented in the book of Charlie Grechenik, where mostly integration theory and vector valued integrals are used in order to do this reconstruction. The usual formulation is that we are getting a reconstruction which is meant to be in the weak sense, but weak sense in the sense of, of Hilbert spaces. So that means you're saying whenever I write a scalar product, an integral over a, with vector values in the, in the Hilbert space, I try to compute the coordinates. So essentially you would say, well, if I would take a coordinate system and I would like to take the nth coordinate of an object in the Hilbert space, I would take a scalar product of the integral with respect to the coordinates, but then uh, I try to do it by putting the scalar product in the, with the coordinate vector into the integral. So it's kind of a weak integral essentially means I'm giving you an element in the Hilbert space coordinate wise. Now, you don't have to take an explicit orthonormal basis in the separable Hilbert space, but that would be one way to understand it, to reduce a vector valued integral to a, to a general uh, thing. Now, this has some limitations because if you go to Banach spaces, then uh, the way how you do it, you're uh, getting an element of the bidual space. And especially if the Banach space is not reflexive, like a Hilbert space, then you have to either work extra or, and the whole integration theory is usually a cumbersome thing. Therefore, I would like to explain to you the way how I see it. And uh, tr of course I have to avoid this. Now, uh, if you look back at the very beginning of the course in the first pages, I was explaining to you that while we all know what matrices are doing, they're mapping from Rn to Rm, they're doing linear combinations. But of course you can also take the transpose matrix, which is mapping back in the opposite direction. But uh, if you take the correct thing, which is transpose conjugate, so we're in the Hilbert space setting of the complex n dimensional space, then multiplying with the transpose conjugate is just taking scalar product. So what are we doing when we take the short time Fourier transform? We're taking a bunch of scalar products or a continuously parameterized family with the phase space as parameter set, but we take a lot of scalar products. So what is the adjoint while we're going back from the transpose conjugate to the matrix? What is applying a matrix to a vector or column vector is doing linear combinations. So this idea could allow you to say, well, maybe the joint is just a synthesis. Whereas we're taking scalar products with pi set G, and now we are having a more compressed notation. Instead of doing a time frequency shift with T and S, we write set is a point in the complex plane or in the phase space in multi-dimension. So it's a pair T and S in RD cross RD hat. So that's to indicate that we're having different meanings at the moment for the space. And then uh, the claim is that maybe this should be such an integral. And again, in the Hilbert space setting, you have to make sure that the integral is meaningful. For us, an integral is a limit or well, an applying a measure, and therefore we try to discretize it. And that's actually a way how we could do it. So we could say, well, uh, first of all, uh, we stay away from the most general case. We do it approximately for a dense subspace. And whatever approach you choose, bounded continuous function with compact support are always dense in L2 for any of those uh, characterizations. So if you give me such a function, and of course you could say now it's even integrable and compactly supported and continuous or so, but we could view it as a bounded measure, then you can approximate it. So I'm writing instead of f of set as an amplitude of pi of set g, I'm writing it, it's a vector valued function pi set of g with respect to the measure with density f of set d set, and we discretize the measure. Now, how can we do it? Well, we say, 
we take the measure F applied to our psi i, our partition of unity. So practically it means uh, think of a, a paper in the plane uh, a square with a square pattern. You're integrating over the bins, which are, uh, so the psi i could be like integrating F over these boxes at lattice points K. And then you take the pi of the midpoint. So that would be a very nice thing. And the total sum of the absolute values is uh, summable. Actually, we have finitely many of them for every pupu. So the point is, you would have to show that these elements are a Cauchy net, even in the sense of a zero. A zero is now a well-defined space. And therefore, we can take a limit in the zero sense. And uh, by then, by taking the L2 limit, we have this. Because we know in a joint operator, uh, and the same is true for the conjugate operator, has the same norm as the original operator. So we have stated that VG is isometric from signal space to images. Therefore, the joint operator defined on the whole space actually will be also bounded by the same norm. So it's also uh, um, non-expansive. It's not, it has a null space, so it's not isometric anymore. But if the mapping from signals to uh, spectrograms is isometric, it's non-expansive. And this property is going over to the conjugate operator. Now, I would like to, instead of uh, doing this uh, in, in full detail, this, this probably will come later, and I will try to write down the details. I was trying to, to connect it better so that you can compare it also with the way how it is described with, uh, with in the book of Charlie Grachenik. So it's more like a different view on the proofs that you find in this book. And that's also a very useful property or so that you have to say, well, we can define the short-term Fourier transform for a pair of L2 functions um, by saying we take the tensor product of those two functions, then transform it by an FN transformation, and then we take a partial Fourier transform. So what are the building blocks of this here? We have to take a tensor product, which means we have F tensor G, is simply a product of the function f as a function of t and times g as a function of s. Then we have to do a simple affine A's for affine transformation of a function of two variables, which means we do a shearing operation. We shift at level, uh, we, we, we do this transformation. So we could, I could even argue that uh, on the plane, so on our 2D actually, this is an automorphism. So this is not only just a transformation, but it's an area preserving transformation, uh, which is isometric and invertible and uh, harmless. So, and then from this view, from this function, we do a partial Fourier transform. So we do a Fourier transform with respect to the V variable. So it's a harmless exercise, a one line proof to say that if you put this at a, at a position T and S, you get exactly the same thing. And you see, of course, we take a one dimensional Fourier transform with respect to one particular variable. And you have seen there's some shifts involved. So it, it looks very plausible. And if you do it, it will work fine. Now, uh, the claim is that this procedure moves you into uh, as zero again. So we, I would like to show you, but in, let's say not prove in detail, but give you an indication that the properties of a zero and their useful properties are such that the short-term Fourier transform is in a zero of two D variables if both the window F and the window G and the signal F are in a zero. So what are the ingredients? We need to say, well, if you're giving me a bunch of functions in the zero of one variable or RD. And if this sum is finite, this infinite sum is finite, then I can add up those functions and you will get uh, a function which is in a zero. But even more so, you get all the functions in the two dimensional space in this way. So if somebody is saying, well, I have added up finitely many or countably many things, then of course, 
it's very easy to see where we know that C0 is embedded into, a uh, zero is embedded into C0. So these guys will be in C0, these will be in C0, the tensor product will be in C0. So this sum is not only a formal expression with VARC terms, with objects which are called tensors. These are serious, simple-minded functions of two variables. They're absolutely convergent. So I'm getting some function f in, in, uh, in um, C0 of 2D variables. Uh, but of course, you can do a lot of representations. And usually I'm saying this is an admissible representation. This term comes up several times with atomic representation. So our atoms are now elementary tensors. The price of an atom is the product of the two S zero norms of this here. And whenever you have this side condition, it's an admissible representation. But when you want to get a norm, you have to make, get rid of the non-uniqueness of a representation and you take the infimum over all those representations. Unfortunately, and it would be a cumbersome task to find out the best possible representation. Maybe there's a, for every representation you have a slightly better, but there's an infimum and it's clear because you control the, the if the function f is non-zero, the represented function is zero, non-zero, then you can control um, the supernorm of this capital F by this expression. So it cannot be zero. So this infimum is a, really a positive number. You have to sit down, verify that this is a norm and that um, with this property, you can get an embedding and that uh, essentially this zero tensor, projective tensor product with a zero is exactly a zero of R2D. Why is this useful? Because if somebody is giving you a function and we first have to show that this is invariant, then you can take a partial Fourier transform and the Fourier transform applies just to the second variable and the zero of RD is going to a zero of RD. And the other aspect that we need to, to give such a proof is uh, anyway a useful statement that if you apply an automorphism or transformation of the argument of a zero of any variables, you're staying here. So what I'm saying here is take those tensor product representations, apply the transformations, it's still in the space. You can rewrite it as a tensor product and then you apply the partial Fourier transform. So uh, in this setting, we have an indication why we get the mapping VG is mapping the product of this space into a zero prime. And actually uh, we have an estimate and that's very nice because normally you have only two estimates or supernorm estimates. No, we can control it and the product is up to some constant, which of course depends on the choice of the concrete norm on your space. Now here you have the argument the F2 is something applying just to the second variable you do it for elementary tensors, you do it for limits and so on. So we get a very nice property. And so instead of doing the, the isometric trick, I'm saying now, okay, now VG is mapping uh, a zero of one variable into a zero of two variables. So we use our adjointness trick. Whenever somebody is giving you a linear bounded operator from one Banach space to the other Banach space, you can uh, kind of do the inverse of directions now for the dual of the second space back to the dual of the first space. So we call, I call it still VG star, also it's slightly different. I mean, I'm correctly speaking, I would say I talk now about the joint operator, but it's still, uh, it's still good. Um, and it allows you to, to do this. And what we have seen for joint operators, they are weak star, weak star continuous. So the standard trick is, oh, I don't know what this abstract object is. Let's insert something that is very, very simple. So what is very simple? Discrete measures. Discrete measures, I mean, are, are linear combinations of Dirac measures. So uh, linear, we know that they are weak star dense. So if I understand what this operation, this formally defined operation is doing on a, on an elementary Dirac measure, I can guess and I can even guarantee that if it's meaningful, I can extend it and it will work for the full, full space or at least for discrete measures, which are absolutely convergent sums of Dirac's. Uh, 
So the claim is if I apply, if you give me a delta and I have applied the synthesis operator with uh, for the window Fourier transform with window G, and this G has to be in a zero, a nice window as an engineer would do anyway, then this is simply synthesis. I mean, saying, oh, just one times this building block. And this is a time frequency shift operator. So, okay, so I have already explained very much how it is. And so we just have to go through this one line argument. So this, aside from the abstract argument, we have a one line argument. The joint operation on an element in the dual space of whatever applied to an element of the original space is the same as applying the delta, which is the functional on the VG of F. So this is just definition of what is the joint operator. What is a delta applied to a VG of F is the evaluation. What is the value of the short time Fourier transform at a point set? It's a scalar product. So we see that a scalar product uh, between, uh, the, so, so kind of the VG, the set of F is the same as F with this. And now the, the uh, idea is that this means I have an integration which uh, is an, can be written as an integral, which is the action of the pi set G on F. So we have an abstract functional, here we have a concrete functional, and therefore the VG star P set has to be exactly the element which is represented here. So that's that's kind of the idea, and uh, the general stuff is of course, if we take uh, more general elements mu, then you have to approximate them. This is supposed to be size of psi to zero that has to be corrected, and uh, that will be a, 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 an element uh, which is well defined as an element of a zero prime. So this is kind of how you expand it to the general setting, but we don't have to do it. In the L2 setting, of course, it reduces to the weak integral. And in the setting when you have elements in S0, uh, then we have even convergence, but this is a technical part and I'll leave it out. So uh, what uh, else do we have? Well, maybe I don't have to go into this. Now, uh, I think we have done a lot of abstract theory now, and therefore I would like to uh, not continue with the abstract stuff, but rather switch over to some MATLAB experiments. I have prepared now um, uh, some window. Okay, it's where it is. Disappeared. No, this is not the right window. Okay. Here it is. Actually, I, I, I would say that uh, all these joint operators really turn into matrices and are even starting to prepare our deep psi mu operators, something that you really can represent in MATLAB or so, but uh, Let's do something fairly concrete now and, and try to connect the abstract approach with the, with the discrete version or so. So um, I had a course yesterday for a workshop in India and uh, I will maybe use some of these things. I also uploaded that talk uh, to the internet and send you the link, but I start to redo it now in, in a different setting with some short explanations. So my standard setting is uh, signal size 480 and uh, with with two lattice constants I'm approaching the, the theory of Gaber expansions. Um, the lattice constants with the horizontal shift of 20 and the vertical shift or frequency shift by 16. On purpose I try to make them different or so but maybe uh, we'll see what, what, what it does. And then I take the Gauss function, which is a discrete Gauss function of size 480. 
And uh, the point is that um, this is something that we have prepared, but uh, I will have to explain. It means that I am taking the continuous Gauss function and I make sure that by periodizing and sampling it in an appropriate way, I'm getting 480 values. Roughly speaking, it's the values of a periodized function, uh, which, which is sampled, um, but practically it's just sampled on an interval. But the main point is when I insert it into MATLAB, um, it's not looking like here that I'm having zero component, but it's, uh, it's uh, something where you're uh, uh, starting with value at zero is the first component. So I'm starting to sample with a certain lattice constant uh, at zero, which means the first coordinate is, is one, of course, for a Gauss function. Uh, then I'm going to the right until I have collected, roughly speaking, uh, 241 samples because the right endpoint is the same as the left endpoint of my periodized function. So I don't have to reproduce the, the same. And then I'm starting from there. And the last sample in my MATLAB vector is really the value, which is the second as the same value as the second one. So symmetry of a function is uh, very much uh, like, uh, is, is that meant in the function in the sense of functions on the unit circle. So I'm getting something uh, and uh, this something is uh, my discrete Gauss function. Maybe I do my comp norm routine, explaining also to you that comp norm simply means that I'm taking two vectors and I expect that they might be equal, but maybe one is a row vector, the other is a column vector. Maybe they're not normalized properly uh, and so I run, rerun it again, and you see it tells me yes, uh, the difference is uh, in norms is something which I expect to be the square root of n, which of course is true. So uh, the FFT is um, all all the time um, correct. So I have another version of doing it, which is FFT unitary. So then, of course, you're getting a factor of one. So uh, if I want to say that the discrete Gauss function, which is coming from the continuous Gauss function, it should be exactly invariant, then I would like to take this. So now I can say this is something that we would like to understand better. How is the short time free transform going? And uh, for this reason, I just generate a random signal. In my MATLAB toolbox, I have decided not, I mean, random means positive with values between one and uh, zero and one. If you take a random image, it has a huge DC component because on average, you will have one half as an average value and that times the number of pixels, which is huge. And then the spectrogram, or the, sp the, the two-dimensional Fourier transform looks uh, terrible. So uh, when I take complex valued functions, I make sure that the values of these complex valued functions are in the range of minus one half to plus one half. And of course, then I normalize it. So also my Gauss function didn't have amplitude one at the origin because I was normalizing it. We have seen that the short time Fourier transform should be should be normalized. Uh, okay, so I have now a random signal, a vector in L2, a discrete vector of L2, and the norm you see here is one. And I have a command which says, do the short time Fourier transform. And it's really meaning take that window, this Gaussian window, move it in a cyclic way to the right. So it, after n half, it appears from the left. Uh, multiply your vector, which for me always is a row vector, um, with this take a free transform and, and put it into a column of a matrix. And so it's very nice to take always such pictures. They always look like this. And there are some dark dots like these dots here. And if you look, these are the zeros of the short time free transform of a random signal. And they have a very nice distribution. So you can look at them as a point process 
And then you will find out they're like little molecules in the air. They are not overlapping. They are not gluing together. Uh, so there are kind of a well distributed points. But here you see these dark blue points. Now, what the next step is that we want to do a lattice point. And then, of course, I have to show you because what I want to have is this centered image or display. So zero is in the middle, which is in MATLAB terms. This point is coordinate number one, one. And uh, so I'm saying I'm taking a lattice, which in the horizontal direction is n by n. In the horizontal direction, the gap is a, which is 20, and in the vertical direction is 16. And of course, we have a problem in the following sense that when we display time frequency in a continuous way, you would say high frequencies like score are higher up. Uh, later pieces of the piece music are more to the right because we are used to read from left to right. If you think of a matrix, you're saying I'm sitting in the third row and fifth column, so you're going down. And that's how we arrange things. So when we are saying frequencies increasing, we're increasing from this here and we go down. And uh, as I, you have seen, each dot in the plane, it's now as point set in the plane, corresponds to an operator, which is the time frequency shift. So much, so essentially this point here would mean you're going to the right by, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, five times 20 is 100 pixels to the right. So we're sitting at column number 101. And then I'm going down by 16, two times 16, so it's two, three, four, and so on. But you're coming back from above. Of course, you can say I'm rotating backwards by three times 16, which is 48. So that would be uh, um, each point is now representing an operator and an operator applied to our window, which has been used to create this short term Fourier transform, is creating a family with 720 building blocks. So uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the uh, connection to frame theory, so to say, or, or to this, is the following we have the short time Fourier transform, and we sample this. For short time Fourier transform of the signal X with window G, and we sample and now we're sampling matrix, and you describe the matrix by taking which rows are you taking. So now the order is switching from uh, frequency second variable to row numbers, it's, it's you're going down. Um, so this is a, something, an agreement that you have to do. And then you're going in the time direction, you're sampling, and you get. Of course, uh, a number of terms, and it's n over b rows and n over a columns. And if you compare the number of points that you have, it's uh, n over a times n over b, which is n squared divided over a times b. And if you say, well, how much more is it multiplicative compared to n? We have 480 points. And then you have to say, yes, I have to multiply it with n over a times b. So it's uh, uh, exactly n times 3 over 2. So we have redundancies 3 over 2. The dimension of our Gaber family, or the number of elements of our Gaber family, is 720, which is 3 half of 480. So this is a simple uh, redundancy count in finite dimensions. Now, of course, you would like to see what the building blocks are of a Gaber family. And uh, I'm calling the Gaber family G. I create it from the atom G. And what I'm really doing is I'm saying, well, I have uh, now a uh, lattice size A equal 20 horizontally. That means I have 24 positions, columns which are occupied. At each column, I have um, n over b, which is 48 to, uh, 480 divided by 16. So I have 30 positions in vertical. So I have to multiply with certain frequencies. So I store those frequencies first. And that's why the GAP bus product routine is a little bit faster than the generic one. Um, and uh, I can do this here. Maybe I'm uh, showing you that I have 
it's working no not sure what's sort of going on here yeah it doesn't accept my command here yeah here g uh, lam is got bus that's a routine uh g and lambda norm of g and g lam so the gap bus routine is quite nice to create irregular gamma families we can also play around with this um, but uh, what I wanted to convince you is that uh, you see here the norm is that's the same up to some numerical precision. Now, what is uh, the, the the second more flexible routine doing? It's saying, well, you're giving me a matrix, an XPO matrix, uh, which marks a one at all those points set which are part of your lattice. And uh, then you're trying to, to find out whether you can still use this family or so. Maybe I'm, I'm, I could do this, the same thing. Uh, lam, uh, lam, uh, X is lambda, but I take out lam X of uh, was, what was it? one, one. So that's the position zero is zero. So then I'm saying, well, let's count the number of points that we have in this zero one matrix. Oh, sorry, that was, I should not press the button, but I should run the code. Oh no. Yeah, this, this dots are not okay. Hopefully it works now. I don't want to spend too much time. Yeah, okay. So you see, I have removed the central point. Yeah, maybe I'm even doing a, a spy command, but in the centered way, lam x, so that you can see, I have now a new collection of points. But something doesn't work, or it just takes more time. So uh, you can imagine that if I take uh, an indicator function, which marks all the points, I have 720 points, but now I wanted to remove one point, which means I set the marker from one to zero at position zero, and I get 719 building blocks. Okay, so I, maybe it's, uh, maybe I'm just doing this here, the spy command, it's the traditional MATLAB command, yeah, okay. So uh, it's maybe I try to repeat it once more. And you see here, there is nothing here at this corner. Now I do the same uh, with the spy centered command, which is a slight modification, just putting everything to the center. Yeah, okay. You see here, the hole is here. Here is the gap. And I could uh, even make it more visible with the plot ax, but I think I, I don't have to do it now. Okay, you see. I have taken away this here. And then of course you can say, well, is it still a frame? What happens if I remove it? So you can play around with this. Now, uh, the point that I wanted to make is that uh, if you are saying I'm taking a collection of atoms, which means I don't know, maybe I was saying the coefficients are my signal with the Gabor family then of course the size of this sequence of numbers is uh, uh, maybe i take a, a new section break and then i'm going down so you see i'm getting uh, i'm mul uh, doing a matrix multiplication and i'm getting 720 coefficients which appear as a row vector on the other hand, uh, kind of, um, so I hope you can see uh, the, 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 my, my code. On the other hand, uh, I maybe I'm doing a trivial plot so that it's, everything is moving up.
that's just to make it visible for you. Uh, so we have this size of the coefficients, but what is the size of the sample short time Fourier transform? So I have again my signal, my window, my time shift, my frequency shift. Uh, and then of course it's stored as a matrix. We have seen we are going vertical with 30 positions and we are going here. So kind of there is some, if you want to compare it, you have to say, well, how can I read it out? And of course you have to read it out in the same way as MATLAB would say, what is the index sequence? Yeah, maybe we can also say uh, index lambda is the command where you say, well, I'm going through this zero one matrix and I want to, to, uh, to go through this. And maybe I want to see the first few indices, the first four indices. So uh, it's clear that you're going down uh, in this row, but we also have seen that uh, after 30 positions going down, we are at the second column. So what is Andy Lam of uh, 31 to 34? Um, Again, I can run it and you see it's index 9,600. Uh, and then you can think, well, we are having information in the first column. First column corresponds to zero. The next one is 20 away, which is 20 column number 21. So where do we start? Well, let's start at wall, at, at call. I mean, it has indices of the first 400, uh, of the first 20 columns. So the index of the top row of the 21st column is of course 9,601 because 20 times N is 20 times 480 is 9,600. And then you go down with these indices. And you can imagine that sometimes it's convenient and that's part of the code of this conversion routine that you should know while well, we are sitting actually in column number 21 and we are using rows number one and 17 or we are at frequency shift which is 0, 16, 32 and so on but this is all taken care of, of it and now I'm, uh, I want to demonstrate uh, maybe I'm doing this also here that uh, if we take now this family of individual signals and we take the coefficients or we take directly a fast way to compute only a sample short time free transform that this is not only the same numbers uh, but it is giving you the same uh, uh, numbers in their same order so kind of that's that's kind of quite quite important or so Okay, so uh, we are also interested to find out what is the rank of G. And the rank of G, of course, is full rank. We have 720, oh no, we have yeah, 720 vectors, but they are given this. Now, what is the frame operator? So SXX for me is you take the signal, for me it's a row vector and you may get used to it. I don't want to change it. Um, and then the nice thing is a scalar product of X with Y is exactly X. And then you put Y vertical. So you get the transpose conjugate and you get a collection of all these color products. That's what we have here. And uh, uh, then you're doing uh, this um, synthesis operator. So of course you could say I'm taking the coefficients with respect to my Gaber family and then uh, once I have the coefficients, I'm getting the same thing. So kind of just uh, check the norm. Is Sx really the same as a linear coefficient combination of the Gaber atoms using the coefficients? And uh, yes, the answer is this is exactly the same. Actually, we did the same matrix multiplication. I was just doing this. But that means, of course, that the operator which assigns uh, the linear combinations where you take scalar products with the atoms and then synthesis is just the matrix G prime with G. So that's the completely naive way of generating the Gaber frame matrix. And then I can say, well, is this a good concept? Uh, well, well uh, uh, 
conditioned matrix, so it's a good matrix, do we have good chances to invert it? And the answer is yes, we can do it and we can get uh, this, this thing. So uh, maybe uh, we keep this in mind. We have coefficients which are efficiently computed as samples of the short time Fourier transform. And now I'm uh, doing uh, writing here so that uh, I'm saying now I'm try to reconstruct uh, from the coefficients. Well, uh, what was the way to get the coefficients? It was multiplying by the matrix G prime. So doing taking scalar process, but now it's just multiplying in my case from the right. How can I undo it if I have a matrix of full rank I multiply with the pseudo inverse kind of if it was a square matrix you would say okay we'll take the square matrix but then uh, so I would like to say well is this really a reconstruction is the x the same as x reconstruction and uh, There's a problem. Oh no, it's, oh, sorry, it's just, the plot is gone, but you can still hopefully you still read it. Uh, try to change the size here. Yeah, here uh, you see it's exactly reconstructed or so. Now uh, the the trick is to to say well there is a very nice and very important a role to define the pseudo inverse for the case of the of a matrix of full rank so uh the question is is it so my 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 rule is the pseudo inverse of a matrix can be obtained by taking the matrix uh forming the yeah comp norm so what, yeah, maybe the first thing is the pseudo inverse, uh, whatever it is, uh, but it, uh, this is commuting with the prime command. So the pseudo inverse of a transpose conjugate is the same as the pseudo inverse of the matrix and then taking the uh, converse. So you see here, the, the second one is telling you that it doesn't matter whether you take the pseudo inverse. Now, uh, I have a formula which can be derived from the single value decomposition. And I really would like to tell you if you're teaching a linear algebra course or going into back to this, look at the singular value decomposition and find out why this is true. It's a very simple formula, the pseudo inverse of a matrix. So I'm just doing now the pseudo inverse of G for example, is the same as writing uh, G prime uh, with the pseudo inverse of G with G prime. That's one way to do it. Or uh, doing the same thing. So I'm again having a pseudo inverse of G. And then I'm saying, no, I prefer to take, I'm, I'm, I'm memorizing it in this way. Think of G prime, G, G prime. And then you take a break at the pseudo inverse on the left or on the right hand side. So you, I'm saying you could take the pin, you can do it with random matrices also, G prime with G, and then you multiply with G prime. So let's see if that's working, if I have made a typo, hopefully not. So the life editor is really a good achievement. You're seeing it's, it's fine. Now, what if you have a matrix which is invertible like the frame operator? So we have seen the frame operator is GG prime. So uh, what is, if we take the inverse of uh, G prime with G, or if I take the pseudo inverse of G prime G? Of course, it's supposed to be the same. And uh, this is by the words, why is pseudo inverse interesting? Well, if you have a matrix which is not invertible, it allows you to invert. Even a rectangular matrix has a pseudo inverse, it inverts the invertible part in a given matrix. 
if you give me an invertible n by n matrix like our frame operator S, then of course uh, the inverse is uh, the pseudo inverse. What is the difference between the two things? Well, the pseudo inverse is based on the singular value decomposition of the matrix and it inverts the parts of the, of the singular value decompositions, putting them together again, uh, which is different from just doing quick Gauss elimination to compute the inverse matrix. So if you have a very instable matrix, maybe both of them exist and may be slightly different. You also see it's not exactly the same code. It gives numerically the same result, but it's not exactly the same code. Otherwise it would have a zero here. So we have this rule. So if you're putting this together, all these things, then uh, the, the, the way how to, to view it is now, I should have put the, yeah, maybe uh, we, we can take this. If you do the same rule now, not with G, but with G prime, then you get it's G, yeah. And then you have G prime G. So maybe I copy this formula here, one last step and uh, put it here. But now I'm replacing G with G prime. It's kind of for the protocol. So the G prime prime is G. The G is replaced by G prime. Uh, and the G prime is being replaced by pi. So I run it again. And of course, that will be the same. So it should be okay. All the results are fine. And then we observe that uh, we have been able to recover the function uh, before by applying the pseudo inverse. But now the pseudo inverse can be written as the pseudo inverse of this. But actually here we can write the S. So last, uh, last repetition. So G prime G is what we call the frame operator. And of course, uh, there will be no change in the observation if I have not made a typo. So this is also okay. So if somebody says, well, what you have to do is to undo the coefficient mapping. So uh, instead of multiplying with G prime, we have to then apply the pseudo inverse of G prime. But how can I do it? Well, I do this in this order. So I have to take uh, this and that means um, that this is exactly the dual family. And so maybe I'm just saying, uh, maybe I'm trying to do more lines here. Uh, I'm doing a section break. Yeah, uh, a little bit, yeah, here it's okay. So I'm saying GD is the, uh, maybe, maybe I'm saying, GD is, is the pinf of GD prime, of G prime, yeah, sorry. That's this pseudo inverse. Uh, the point is that this is because I have a transpose format by the pinf and the transpose by this, that this format is the same as the original matrix. So we have the same number of, I'm watching, clicking the wrong, yeah. I have 720 row vectors again, and uh, GD should be the first row in this row system. Uh, we do a plot, we want to take a look at this guy here, and we would, GDD is the Garber family created back from this one single element by the same way. And I want to convince you and finish for now by showing you that the GD, this thing that you compute with the pseudo inverse is the same as the Garber family from this single element. And uh, you see how, how it looks. And the error is really, so the pseudo inverse of the Garber family created along a lattice is the same as this. And then the last statement is the recipe was uh, we should take uh, the element G D by applying the inverse of the frame operator to this uh, element. 
and uh, let's do it again and then you will see that this is really working so we have we can understand what you see here is everything is fine that uh, we can either build a whole Garber family we can take it uh, in order to and then take the pseudo inverse of this family or we can take the inverse frame operator and apply it to this here. And this is a well-conditioned matrix or so. And therefore, maybe a uh, last step, uh, one more step I would like to say. Let's take a look at, uh, or maybe I'm doing a spy command on the absolute value of the matrix S. So is there any, can, you, can we maybe see some structure? Now it's a little bit risky. It might be not, uh, very well visible, but uh, yeah, okay. It's, it's not. Uh, I will I will show it to you next time. So if you if you go, uh, maybe I'm saying where this is bigger than uh, 100 epsilon. So where it's kind of significant, probably it just says where. Uh, where the entries are not zero in the strict sense. And uh, yeah, okay, so that, that's that's great, yeah. So you see it's a numerically computed matrix and it looks very much as if this matrix was really concentrated along side diagonals. And that's really what we can study and what is leading to the so-called Walnut representation of the Garber frame operator. So, but for, for now, it's just interesting up to some numerical noise along the main diagonal, you will see, uh, maybe I'm, I'm making this a little bit bigger and maybe some small values will not show up, but it seems to be a matrix which is mostly concentrated on certain side diagonals. And you see now these wiggles are a little bit more narrow and uh, we will see that there's a lot of structure that they are periodic entries on these side diagonals and all these things which allow to do efficient computation of this dual window. And that's kind of part of Garber's theory and efficient recovery of a signal from the time frequency. But as I said, the short time Fourier transform is the right tool. And this is the MATLAB side of things that allows you to do numerical computations. I will store this and make it available for you. And therefore we finish uh, this session now.